12th September 1941. The first snow reported on Russian front. In the closing weeks of 1941, the Russian rains and debilitating winter can be regarded as secondary factors in Barbarossa's demise. Yet, as stated, the inclement weather still contributed to the Wehrmacht's failure in toppling the USSR. Marshal Georgi Zhukov, Stalin's top wartime commander, wrote in his memoirs, For the benefit of those who are inclined to hide behind the mud, as the real reason for the Germans' defeat near Moscow, I would like to add that the period of slush in October 1941 was comparatively short. Cold weather set in, and snow fell in early November, making the terrain and roads passable everywhere. Zhukov's viewpoint is certainly accurate relating to the mud, though he does not mention quite how severe the winter of 1941-42 was, a subject which will be discussed further on here. The winter that was to come shortened what the Russians call the Rasputitsa, when the rains turned poor quality roads, pathways and fields into rivers of mud. Zhukov reminisced how the mud stuck to everything, from human feet to the wheels of the barrows and the blades of the spades. The Rasputitsa occurs in the spring each year as well, during March and April, affecting not only Russia, but other nearby states, like Ukraine and Belarus. Alexander Hill, a professor of military history, outlined earlier this month that the Rasputitsa is a reason behind the continued slow progress which the Russian army has made in Ukraine during its ongoing military intervention in that country. The Ukraine war is likely to continue for weeks and maybe months to come. The worst of the mud may yet strike the Russians in April, but Hill wrote that the Rasputitsa will not be an issue in the longer term. We are informed daily of the staunch Ukrainian resistance, which in fairness seems to be precisely that. For how much longer remains open to question. The Russian army is far larger than its Ukrainian counterpart, and the Russian population is more than three times greater than Ukraine. Moscow will be able to bolster its forces if it so wishes, while the Russian military also possesses much stronger firepower and technical ability, and the Russian Air Force has a dominance of the Ukrainian skies, if not yet complete aerial superiority. Meanwhile, on the opposing side to Zhukov was the Austrian-born SS Lieutenant Otto Skorzeny. Like Zhukov, Skorzeny was located on the front line in 1941. Skorzeny wrote in his memoirs that rainfall did not arrive near Moscow until October 19th, when torrential rain fell on the area of Army Group Center, which in three days literally sank into the morass. Hitler had already said in August 1941 that the autumn rain season of the Moscow region begins about mid-October. Even before the 10th of November, the mud was solidifying, with the temperature dropping considerably in the first days of November. The colder conditions were at first welcomed by German soldiers, who had no idea of the winter that lay in store. Skorzeny wrote, We thought, long live the cold. It froze during the night of November 6th and 7th. Slowly the supplies began to flow again. We received ammunition, fuel, some food and cigarettes. Finally the wounded could be evacuated, and preparations were made for the final offensive. With the Rasputitsa at its worst during the second half of October 1941, it had a very serious impact on the German advance. The following August of 1942, on the 9th of that month, Hitler insisted, had it not been for the rain and mud last October, we should have been in Moscow in no time. We have now learnt that the moment the rain comes, we must stop everything. Eminent climatologists Hermann Flohn and Jehuda Neumann in a co-authored study on how the weather impacted the Nazi-Soviet war, recognized that, at the time of World War II, there were very few paved roads in the USSR. Rains and low evaporation rates of the fall season would turn unhardened roads and fields into quagmires, in which many of the tanks, pieces of heavy artillery, and other mechanized transports would dig their own graves by trying to move on. The respite gave the Soviets time to strengthen their rearguard, in the first fortnight of November 1941, the Kremlin dispatched 21 fresh divisions from Siberia and Central Asia to the Moscow front, the sort of reserves that the Germans did not have. The Rasputitsa also impinged on Soviet divisions, but altogether, the inhospitable surfaces had a more negative outcome for the attackers, which was inevitable. 
Fighting a war based largely on defense in the early 1940s, the Red Army was less reliant on mobility than the Germans. Russian tanks, like the T-34, had wider tracks than the Panzers, and they moved more efficiently across the soggy soil. Supplies and logistics were not as great an issue for the Russians, who had a working railway system directly behind them, while the German lines were increasingly stretched. In the first half of October 1941, the Germans had almost annihilated the defenses in front of Moscow, destroying 86 Soviet divisions around the Russian towns of Vyazma and Bryansk, both about 130 miles from the capital. As the rain clouds arrived on the 19th of October, Army Group Center on that day captured Mojaisk, just 65 miles west of Moscow. It is little wonder that Zhukov considered the dates, from the 10th to the 20th of October 1941, as the most dangerous time for the Red Army in the war.